Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, everyone. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio on March 11th, 2016. This is your host, Andrew Fisher, normally broadcasting Wednesdays from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. However, I will be doing a Friday show today from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern because, well... I couldn't get a guest. I thought I was going to get a guest. I was willing to give that guest a little bit of time to see if they would be able to do a show with me. But by the time that deadline that I set passed, I decided, okay, I think I should host the show by myself. And that is exactly what I'm going to be doing right now tonight, hosting the show solo as a lone wolf. It's been a while since I've done one of these. But, hey, I'm actually glad I haven't had a chance to do a show by myself in a while. And I actually enjoy doing them. And I, of course, do need the practice of what radio show host doesn't every so often to do a show themselves. So it's a little bit of a blessing in disguise that I do the show by myself today. And as usual, it seems like I can always rely on the website in5d.com, Greg Prescott, Michelle Walling, I love you, to get me some articles that I could use as a guide throughout this show. I've got five articles here. They have our, our articles with lists in the articles that I can read off of and ad lib and elaborate on in great detail and give it my own unique style that a couple of articles that have been going back like uh, three or maybe four months at most. I'll um, do the articles starting with the earliest and then coming to the most recent at the end. But before I do that, as usual, uh, I see I have only one guest in the uh, chat room, someone who doesn't even uh, have an account. They won't be able to talk in the chat room, but I'm glad you're there. But as usual, first I will do um, the news courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. A source, Clinton IT specialist revealing server details to FBI, quote, devastating witness, unquote. Uh, Another quote here, his importance to this case cannot be overemphasized, unquote. Uh, Former Hillary Clinton IT specialist Brian uh, Pagliano, a key witness in the email probe who struck an immunity deal with the Justice Department, has told the FBI a range of details about how uh, Hillary Clinton's personal email system was set up according to an intelligence source close to the case who called him a devastating witness. Uh, The source said Pagliano uh, told the FBI uh, who had access to the former Secretary of State system as well as when and what devices were used uh, mounting to a roadmap for investigators. Uh, Before I go any further about this, all those people that are wondering why isn't Hillary Clinton being uh, locked up and sentenced and indicted and all the rest uh, for this, Well, the short answer is because if someone does try to indict her, then she will reveal all the dirty laundry and dirty secrets of the rest of the government as payback. So it's kind of, I mean, is that really a bad thing? Well, from the standpoint of the people in the government who want to, um, who want to expose her, yes, it kind of would be a bad thing. I mean, because people worry about their reputations too much nowadays, but that's the only reason this is stalling. However, I do remember in my, I don't know if it was in my interview with um, Brad Johnson and Adronis or whether it was just another video with Brad Johnson. I don't even know if Brad Johnson was contacting Adronis at this time, but he did say something about the very good possibility of Hillary Clinton being arrested um, sometime before this year's end, and I hope that does happen. It boggles the mind that people could, st- unless they're totally clueless and ignorant, could still be supporting Hillary Clinton through this. Um, after all, the evidence shows that her... Um, that all these emails, it's uh, totally incriminating, and I just can't resist. You know, whenever I talk about Hillary, I can never help but point out that in David Icke's Revelations of a Mother Goddess documentary, Arizona Wilder, who had a chance to witness um, uh, political and corporate leaders who were reptilian aliens shapeshift during uh, satanic rituals that she participated in, she did say, quote, I saw Hillary Clinton before I knew she was Hillary Clinton, unquote. Make of that whatever you will. Uh, next article. Uh... Michigan, I think this is Michigan, officer dodges bullets during a traffic stop. This is actually a video. Officer narrowly avoids being shot. It wasn't the Matrix, and although Officer Brad Gentry is no Keanu Reeves, he sure has moves like Neo with dash cam footage to back up that claim. Okay, um, the uh, 21-year-old shooter is um, Darion Zamone Clark Brown. Um, don't really have time to get into what this is about, but... Uh, well, first of all, a couple of things here. Uh, no reason for this guy to start shooting the officer like this. But then again, if anybody who listens to Eddie Craig of Rule of Law Radio knows that this officer uh, was almost certainly committing due process violations and breaking the law when he pulled uh, this guy over for an alleged 
transportation violation because if you're not using the roads for commercial purposes, then uh, using the roads is a right and not a privilege. It's only a privilege for those in commerce. And uh, this guy was just doing his right to travel, but he did not have the right to fire upon the officer. So, you know, I don't know how they're going to, if they're going to try to spin this to justify giving police more power and whatnot. But, uh, Maybe they probably know this guy could have been under mind control because uh, some of us said that Edward Archer, the guy in that Philadelphia shooting of, of an officer, was uh, under mind control programming when he did that. And Mr. Cat Eye uh, did try to decode the whole incident to show there was some coding behind it. But all right, uh, make of that whatever you will. Uh, next article, whose new questions and answer on glyphosate confirms uh, toxicity of Roundup? Will the EU agencies listen? Uh, the World Health Organization, that was meant by WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, has just published a clear question and answer form on the toxicity of glyphosate. They made ingredient of Monsanto's best-selling herbicide concoction, Roundup. It leaves no question that the herbicide is truly genotoxic, causing damage to life everywhere. All right, so I guess don't be using Roundup anymore to... Uh, as a herbicide, it's only going to do a more harm than good. So, and the World Health Organization, some might say that that name is a joke because it's not about uh, maintaining health because it's run by Illuminati connections. But there are lots of good people in these organizations that are Illuminati controlled. So, I guess that good is overpowering the evil now. Of course, it's overpowering the evil now. <laughs> the Archon Control System is cannibalizing itself. So, this, um, I guess this is a great sign, isn't it? That we, well, it was already, the truth was already known, but now it's becoming public about Roundup and its dangers. Uh, next article Liberals now hate Caitlyn Jenner because she's a conservative. A transgender star no longer stunning and brave after calling Hillary a fucking liar. Uh, after the transgender star trashed Hillary Clinton as a effing liar, uh, liberals took to Twitter to vent about how much they displeased the former. Olympic um, gold medal winner. So, um, well, I, did, I don't think I even know who Caitlyn Jenner was because I don't really pay attention to the Olympics. I used to, but uh, I don't anymore ever since I found out that it's all just one big Illuminati ceremony and getting the whole world involved as part of the brainwashing. So, uh, just because someone um, is a conservative, liberals have to hate them. So... <sighs> It, why do we have to hate? There doesn't have to be hate. Don't give in to hate that leads to the dark side, even if people disagree with you. Now there's going to be a few Donald Trump articles here. Uh, Trump is right about Islam hating the West. <clears throat> Excuse me. Polls show Muslims have negative view of Westerners. Well, yes, and it wouldn't be happening like that if all these illegal immigrants that are refugees from the Middle East were coming into this country as part of an Illuminati plot to destabilize America, Europe, and, and other countries by um, bringing migrants in without a passport or valid visas and totally screwing over our lives and taking our jobs and all the rest of it in the Cloward and Piven style. So if that wasn't happening, then I don't think Islam would be hating the West and uh, they wouldn't be having negative view of Westerners. So, I mean, Donald Trump saying uh, we should have surveillance on all Muslims um, okay, the only time I think that would be, have any bearing or truth to it is if you're at the border. I mean, anybody can get the border, sur securing the border and surveilling the border could go hand in hand. So you want to put surveillance on the border to keep an eye on all the um, Islams, uh, all the Muslims there and all the non-Muslims for that matter. But uh, I don't know exactly what Donald Trump was thinking when he said that. Um, <laughs> Does he understand that the NSA surveillance system is not about safety, but about tyranny and control and blackmail? Uh, I'm sure he does, but he has to spin it in a way so they don't assassinate him like JFK. So uh, another Trump article, uh, quote, a total disgrace, unquote. Trump's calls out, um, quote, dishonesty of press, unquote, for equating supporters with Nazis. Uh, quote, what they did on the Today Show was a disgrace, unquote. Leading GOP candidate Donald Trump lambasted the media Thursday for attempting to draw comparisons between fervent supporters um, at his rallies and Nazi Germany. Now, this whole issue of uh, the media trying to demonize Trump because the establishment is scared of Trump. Uh, Trump is um, not establishment. I mean, maybe back in the day he was uh, siding with the Illuminati in some regards, but those days seem to be going away and are almost completely gone. 
don't let the fact that he's a multi-billionaire fool you. In many ways, he became a billionaire because, uh, well, he's a workaholic. So he earned it in a sense. But, um, I mean, is Donald Trump a red herring, as some might say, diverting from important issues? Well, I used to think that, and maybe to some degree I still do, but that Donald Trump equals red herring ideology that I used to believe in is seemingly waning. I I think it often doesn't make sense to look at him like that anymore. And, uh, well, you know, Nazi Germany, that phrase is going to be used to, to demonize everybody. I mean, even the conspiracy theorists and truth seekers like to say it's like Nazi Germany when talking about the tyranny, and, and it is. So, uh, uh, Donald Trump, as long as you understand that the president is not supposed to act as a dictator, but is supposed to act within the confines of the laws passed by Congress, then and act as the commander in chief too, then that works for me. That's what we need. Uh, well, another Trump article here. Uh, Trump says, "Enough with the debates." Vince McMahon should have put them on because they were WWE. That's a quote there. A GP from under Donald Trump says he's done with the debates. Trump admitted that he was unaware that there were more upcoming debates. Um, and Decal read that there are too much. You've had enough debates, in my opinion, Trump said. They've been like Vince McMahon should have put them on because they were WWE. So, uh, I mean, I haven't watched any of these debates. I know InfoWars does a lot of uh, analyzing of them, but... I haven't been really paying attention to them. I mean, uh, I am political, but then again, I think talking about the Illuminati is more important than talking about their uh, puppets in in government. Although I will say that as the archive control system cannibalizes itself, I don't talk about either the Illuminati or politics as much as I as I used to. I mean, with the exception of this new, these new segments at the beginning of shows, obviously, but in general, it's um, more positive. And I, st- I still want to talk about those, these things just to wake up the sheeple and all because it's a critical step to wake people up to this stuff to talk about conspiracy theories and how the law is screwed up and such before you start talking about things like aliens and consciousness. Got to take baby steps when waking some people up. But but then again, um, I'm through with the debates too. <laughs> uh, I think this may be the last Donald Trump article. Only two more after this. I'm doing the show myself, so I think I can do 15 minutes instead of 10 minutes of the news. Um, next article, Trump victory is factor in Mexico's risk models. Central banker says... Trump has pledged to renegotiate or terminate NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, saying it has been a disaster for the U.S. Thank you for saying the obvious, Trump. Uh, Mexico Central Bank Governor Agustin Carstenes, uh, Carstenes, however you pronounce that, uh, said the possibility of a Donald Trump presidency is implicitly reflected in the risk models used by policymakers after sensing the importance to Mexico's economy of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, Yeah, you know, China recently was not very thrilled about the possibility of a Trump presidency, saying it would uh, not work well for them for various reasons. And, well, do they think that Donald Trump is going to act like a dictator? Well, I just said a couple minutes ago that I hope he doesn't, because that's not the president's job. His job is commander-in-chief of the military, and to faithfully execute the laws prescribed by by Congress. And Congress has the ability to override the president's vetoes. (laughs) So president is not supposed to be a dictator in any way. Hope Trump will realize that. Then again, I sound like a broken record there. Uh, next article. Citizens of Hawaii beat Monsanto lobbyists against right to spray pesticides bill. A breath of fresh air, if you pardon the pun. Uh, residents of the Hawaiian Islands just breathed a sigh of relief, literally, as the deadline passed for Hawaii's House uh, Judiciary Committee to uh, hear House Bill 849 uh, relating to right to to farm that would force residents to succumb to pesticide spraying without any say. Uh, Bill 849 amends Hawaii's Right to Farm Act to ensure that counties uh, cannot enact laws, ordinances, or resolutions to limit the rights of farmers and ranchers to engage in agricultural practices, including spraying with uh, carcinogenic pesticides. Uh, well, it's a good uh, thing that the citizens of Hawaii beat the uh, Monsanto Corporation lobbyists. Um, however, it's funny I mentioned this because I recently watched a Dave Champion video. I'm watching a lot more Dave Champion videos. Something about that guy resonates with me, and I really seem to like his um, patriot community diehard attitude there. But he recently, in a video I saw, talked about how Hawaii used to have kings and queens, and the way it became the 50th state was the American military was um, saying, join us, and the queen of Hawaii at the time refused. Hawaii was the 50th state, yeah, Alaska the 49th, Hawaii the 50th. And she refused uh, to let Hawaii become the 50th state. 
So the American government basically said, uh, we're going to hurt you really bad and your citizens really bad if you don't let us uh, further our empire and make you the 50th state. And then the queen gave in and screwed over her people and didn't bother to resist. Would she have stood a chance against the American government, the American military, which is the Roman Empire of the modern era? Um, probably not, but many would say this is one of the situations where the queen, if she cares about her country, would fight to the death, and they just gave in. So Hawaii became the 50th state because of tyrannical way of force means, and uh, it makes you sick. And people in Puerto Rico don't actually like being a... Uh, U.S. territory, by the way, on the other side of North America there. Puerto Rico is from Hawaii, but uh, it's not the 51st state, but they don't like being a U.S. territory. Um, some guy I have that's friend with, friends with me told me about how I wasn't aware of this, actually, about how the Puerto Rican, uh, I think it was in either the 50s or the 60s, when Puerto Rican nationals were trying to assassinate people within the U.S. capital because they, were, they did not like the, US, the way the U.S. government was treating Puerto Ricans and such. Well... If only Hawaiians could be like that. <laughs> well, I, I'm not saying it's okay to kill people in government but or start shootings in a Capitol building, but still, people need to understand that if your government, or not your government, another government wants to um, make you part of its empire by force, sometimes it is in your best interest to fight to the death. If they kill you, so what? You're infinite consciousness. <laughs> All right, one last article here. Former Prime Minister says Fukushima almost destroyed Japan. TEPCO and Japan's nuclear safety advisor were of little help. It has been five years since the Fukushima disaster. Many of us have forgotten the press describing millions of gallons of nuclear waste leading and leaking into the ocean. But nearly 400,000 people who had to be evacuated remember the event vividly. The panic and irresponsibility by TEPCO following the earthquake, tsunami, and meltdowns was unprecedented. In a recent interview with The Telegraph, Japan's former Prime Minister, uh, Naoto Kan, uh, stated that the country had come within a paper-thin margin of being absolutely devastated. Well, a certain ET contactee by the name of um, Tana, or Sunfire, as she is also called, uh, who is in contact with the Galactic Federation of Planets, said that there are some ETs who are doing their best to keep Fukushima radiation in check. It's a good thing they are, because otherwise it would probably be a, new, a um, global extinction event. And uh, although it's done a lot of damage nonetheless, so almost, and definitely a staged event. I mean, was the earthquake... Well, then again, uh, John Lear, in my interview with him, he said there was no earthquake. It was just uh, bombs being exploded under the ocean, planted bombs that caused a tsunami. But lots of people would differ with that, but some would differ if, if it was an earthquake, whether it was caused by harp or whether the earthquake was natural, and just the explosions that caused Fukushima the, the, in the, the reactors to explode. They were full-blast um, explosions, and that was definitely something that had to have been staged. David Icke talks about that in some um, show he does a few years ago in Europe about a Fukushima stage, and he believes that. But, well, maybe we'll get a consciousness shift someday to uh, get out of all this radiation. That would be nice. But take your iodine to keep you safe from that. So, let's see. I have uh, some a couple of other people here in the chat room. Uh, before I start doing the articles, um, nobody's written anything yet. It's going to be hard, kind of hard for me to type in the chat because I'm doing the show by myself today. But... With that being said, uh, let me just get a drink of water here, and then I'm going to start doing these N5D articles. It's funny, I usually don't have to drink water whenever I have a guest on. My mouth doesn't get dry for some reason. But now it's definitely going to get dry because I'm doing the show by myself. And uh, I'll try to talk slowly, try to maybe get two hours in. But if I don't get two hours in, that's only because I'm a fast talker. So uh, first article here. Uh, hopefully it'll load here. Okay. I've had internet connection problems recently. I do hope that doesn't happen. Ask angels and guys to make sure that doesn't happen during this show. But anyway, 16 signs that you have hidden healing abilities written on February 16, 2016 by Jeff Wilson of the spiritscience.net. So I guess I'll just go by the uh, list here and ad lib as I go along. Uh, first hidden healing ability. You are frequently told how soothing it is to be around you. Well, that just means your vibration is changing and people's, their vibration is changing and is upgrading. And naturally, you would feel more soothing to be around those people whose vibration is changing and they're more sensitive to it, too. Not sensitive in a, ne in a harmful way, like you're sensitive to pain or something, just sensitive to the, to the high frequency. And um, well, it makes sense that people would tell you you seem more soothing. 
because they become more sensitive to it in a good way. Uh, number two, you and the people in close physical proximity of you rarely get sick. Well, um, I guess that does uh, does make sense that uh, you wouldn't get sick if you have um, hidden healing abilities, not ability to heal thyself as Wolverine of the X-Men can do. If that analogy makes sense. And um, therefore you could uh, heal people that are in close proximity to you even though you don't try to do it. Uh, therefore it's hidden ability because you're not trying to do it, but you can do it. And uh, I mean... That's really not the case in my job, though. If I had the ability to heal people, I'm not doing a good job of it, but that's only because my mother, who doesn't seem to understand that sun gazing does not hurt your vision, it also doesn't seem to understand that flu shots are not harmful, and she continues to give vaccines on a yearly basis to the employees. I always decline them, but it makes me sick to my stomach to see her do that. She refuses to acknowledge that vaccines are harmful. Oh, my God, listen to my interview with Leslie Minuki and my dear sweet mother. You'll understand uh, what's wrong with you. Leslie Minuki knows what she's talking about. She's not a fool. So uh, that was a good interview I did with her. So definitely recommend people listen to that if you uh, are new to the whole vaccine being toxic issue. But uh, if only I had the ability to – maybe i I got to practice that, have the ability to heal people who are getting sick because lots of people get those flu shots. They get sick afterwards, get the flu. Why doesn't my mother realize there's a problem with that? <laughs> All right, next, our, uh, number three, you are constantly thinking of how to improve people's lives. Well, <laughs> I mean, if you improve your life, naturally other people's lives, will, the, the lives of other people around you will improve because your infinite consciousness, your reflection, your reality sees are a reflection of you. So I don't know if you necessarily would have to think of how to improve people's lives if you just just do do well and all the people around you will do well because you're doing well. So... Just uh, act like you understand that you reap what you sow, and you don't have to constantly think about improving people's lives. Number four, you have probably been diagnosed with anxiety, panic, or mood disorders. Yes, those disorders, they are lies. I remember reading in Jim Mars' book, The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, that bipolar disorder is a phony disease made up by the big pharma to sell their synthetic medication. So uh, don't let that fool you if you've been diagnosed with that. Uh, number five, you are highly empathetic to the point that it disrupts your social life. Yes, um, kind of counterintuitive that you could have hidden healing abilities and yet your social life is disrupted simply because you're empathetic. But then again, being an empath can transfer, among other things, transfer the illness of someone to you. So I guess that's a good thing if you're willing to take the pain, but it can be unpleasant for some people. And it seems like sometimes I take on empathetic qualities. Well, I try to because I, I know I can take the pain because I've taken the pain a lot in my life and gone through a lot of experiences that enabled me to do that. I'm not trying to brag, but I mean, um, playing football, going out in the frigid cold you know, a lot in the winter time. I mean, that stuff uh, really makes a man out of some people. So I encourage you to follow my lead there. All right, number six, you have a family history of healers. Your elders may have been doctors, therapists, medical workers, humanitarian protesters, veterinarian workers, or guidance counselors, anything to help people with the human condition. Well, not just the human condition, but also the animal condition, because it says veterinarian workers, and um, a hierarchy of sorts of what you be, what happens on Earth to you before you become a human. I could be wrong, but it's like, first you start off as a um, one-cell organism, then you become a uh like a multi-cell organism not necessarily a plant yet i think there's like one more before you become a plant and then a plant and then an animal and then a pet animal so you, before becoming a human and then you become a human after that that's the step-by-step -step process on, on planet earth i learned that at the mount shasta conference so um you don't want to heal just humans you want to be able to heal a lot of things even plants so um yeah, if you have uh, healings in your family, then yes, it makes sense that you have hidden healing abilities. I'm staying the obvious there. Number seven, moving on. You walk in public spaces with butterflies in your stomach and heightened senses. Okay, it um, does seem a little counterintuitive that you would have to be a lot nervous by walking around and I, I heightened senses. There, one could interpret that differently, whether having heightened senses is heightened senses is pleasant or unpleasant. But um, butterflies in your stomach, that's only thought of as being unpleasant. And... Um, um, but I, I can understand, like, the same thing with the empathy quality there, that maybe if you have butterflies in your stomach, you're uh, 
taking on the nervousness of other people in, in an empathetic sense. So that could have something to do with it. All right, number eight, you have a way with animals. They react to you more calmly or are just happy to see you. Yes, I've started to have more of a way with animals, among other things. I don't eat meat as much as I used to. I don't know if I'll ever stop eating meat entirely. I could imagine myself on the graph, that that graph, I think it's called a hyperb- hyperbola, where it goes closer and closer and closer and closer to zero, but never actually reaches zero. That's going to be my meat eating habits till the day I die. Getting closer and closer to eating zero meat, but never actually stop eating meat entirely. But in the process of eating less meat, I'm becoming more with nature and more with animals. So, well, follow my lead there. If you uh, eat less meat and try to become more with nature, you'll have more avoid with animals, which will improve your hidden healing abilities. Uh, number nine, strangers spill their life to you <clears throat> with very little prompting. Yes, Mama always taught you don't talk to strangers, but, you know, thinking about that, now that I've reached this part of my life, I'm thinking that all that don't talk to strangers bullcrap, it was just a way of um, of scaring uh, kids and uh, keep keeping people in a state of fear, if you know what I mean. The control system wants you to uh, be in a state of suppression and fear, so they tell you um, don't talk to strangers to keep you... Uh, I mean, there are times, I guess, where that um, we're saying that could make sense, like uh, don't get into a car with strangers. I mean, that would certainly make sense if you're a kid, but uh, but if you're uh, like, a, well, if it's a reptile alien trying to kidnap you, then you're screwed, because <laughs> a lot of um, kidnappings, it was said, happened because the people who kidnapped them were for reptilian aliens who feed off the children. So, but I'm going off the deep end there. When it comes to just talking to strangers on the street, like a simple hi, Mister, how you do, and then. Um, that, that I don't see any problem with that. It's taking the don't talk to strangers in that regard is a little too extreme. And when strangers spill their life to you with a little prompting, then, well, sign you if it any healing abilities because you attract uh, good strangers to you. Number 10 here on the list, you are great at massages, though you have may never have been to school for massages. Well, yeah, massage is a great healing. I have... Uh, not really had any experience in massaging anyone. Rubbed a couple of ladies' shoulders a few times, but that's uh, anybody could do that. So um, I guess it's not really the actual massage as much as the energy and healing transfer from you, your heart, soul essence, and into your hands and transferring it to the to the person you're massaging. Number eleven. Moving on. You experience neck and shoulder pain often. You hold your stress there. Yes, um, I guess the neck and shoulder, that those would be areas where you would hold stress. I mean, that, cause that could vary with other people. But I've had some neck and shoulder pain, too, sometimes when, uh, I've, um, when I've been stressed out. Never wondered why it was uh, in those areas. But, but then again, where, what part of the body do you expect it to be in? <laughs> the stress that you're holding in. All right, moving on, number 12. You revel in being outside. Well, I certainly do, more so than I used to. When I was a kid, I would play on the computer all day when it was sunny, and I realized that was a mistake. Should have uh, gone out into nature, and I wasn't as in tune with nature back then. But now I am, and it's improved my life in so many ways. I assert. So, revel in being outside. Sign of hitting healing abilities for sure. And number thirteen, you are attracted to crystals and are interested in their metaphysical properties. Yes, I've certainly noticed an improvement in that in my life. I do put crystals on my window sills, and I uh, don't know if I line them up in the right fashion. I do try to uh, energize the crystals when it's sunny outside. I haven't put the crystals in moonlight, though. I should try that sometime, because I say moonlight's better than uh, sunlight for healing and uh, energizing crystals. Because crystals, for all intents and purposes, are living rocks, and um, they need to be healed and energized. So number 14 here, you are interested in spiritual sciences like Reiki, energy healing, shamanism, acupuncture, among others. Well, that's a no-brainer. Of course, someone with hidden healing abilities is going to be interested in spiritual sciences. Uh, Number 15, your high level of awareness means you are sensitive to certain foods and drinks. You may often have headaches or digestive issues. Yeah, there are certain uh, foods and drinks that uh, will bother certain people, but then uh, it's worth pointing out that some of those food problems are totally caused by unnecessary con- contamination, like uh, peanut allergies, uh, 
though that was not really an accident. I believe that came about because of some tampering with the uh, with the peanut crop, and uh, that caused people to to get those allergies, those unnecessary and unpleasant allergies. And uh, it's not just with peanuts; it's other foods and drinks, and uh, and lactose intolerances too. Uh, you know, on one hand, it's a little counterintuitive that someone with those uh, headaches or digestive issues could have hidden healing abilities. But then again, if you have abilities that other people don't don't have hidden abilities, then and you're on a world or a matrix where such abilities are not normally designed to happen, then it does make sense in some regard that you'd have problems like headaches or digestive issues or whatnot. It sucks being of a high consciousness when everyone else is asleep. Or I shouldn't say that because people are waking up exponentially, which is a good thing. Our con control system going to go bye-bye soon. <laughs> All right, last but not least on the list, uh, you sometimes feel random chills, warmth radiating from your core, or your palms tingle and pulsate. Yes, random chills. A lot of people shudder for uh, for no reason that they can imagine. There was a Simpsons episode I remember seeing way back in the day when um, uh, somebody was invited over to the uh, Simpsons house, and as soon as Homer and Bart said, you're welcome to come to our house from another location, uh, right before they cut to commercial, they went back to the Simpsons house and showed Marge shuddering right after Homer said, you're invited to our place. And Lisa looked to Marge and said, why'd you shudder like that, Mom? And Marge said, I don't know. Well, <laughs> that was um, quantum entanglement on a macroscopic scale of some sort, with Marge not being very happy about uh, her husband inviting over someone to the Simpsons house who was guaranteed to cause problems for the family. So those random chills might have something to do with that regard, if that makes sense. So uh, <laughs> I hope that makes sense to you guys. Oh, I see I have someone else in the chat room here, Helen Harris. Glad you uh, gave me a wavy smiley face and a flower smiley face. Helen, it's kind of hard for me to talk because uh, I'm doing this in the show by myself. But, hey, I'll try to acknowledge people in the chat room if I see anybody new there. But that's the end of this article. Uh, next article, New Powers and Abilities and DNA Upgrades. Once again, though, I need another drink. Give me a second here. Very fortunate to live in a town that, uh, I do, a town that takes water purification very seriously. Wants to make people to be able to drink out of the taps and uh, not have to worry about it. No fluoride in the... Water in my town, although many would assert you still should uh, filter the water, because um, I mean there's probably just a trace amount of chlorine in there that they put in to kill the li- living organisms and the pipes. You don't know how rusty they could be, but in general, I could easily drink the water in my town without a filter and not have any health problems. All right, but enough of that. Uh, new powers, healing abilities, and DNA upgrades. <clears throat> All right, below is a list of some of the powers you may have already. Uh, you, you may already have or start to get. Uh, this is fun to think about. First one, animal speaking, which is telepathic communication with animals. Anybody want to learn more about that? I recommend listening to the N5D radio interview with Els Bastion from like way back in the day, like 2013, I think that was. Excuse me. Um, next one is enhanced empathy, influencing and receiving emotional energy. Yeah, I already talked about that earlier. Uh, interdimensional perception. Uh, seeing into other dimensions of reality. I mean, we could debate as to what a dimension is, or if a dimension is the same as a density. I'm listening to an Alfred Weber interview now by some guy who I don't think I've ever heard before. Um, I don't remember his name, but I've only gotten like 50 minutes into the interview. It's one, I think it's the most recently uploaded interview on Alfred Weber's YouTube channel, and the guy asserted said something in it, that interview in which he basically asserted that dimension and density are not the same thing. So some people say it's the same, others would say it's not. So and whether dimension and a density is the same as a realm or something that's a completely different issue. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, clairsentience. Yeah, that's the uh, next one on the list. There, they actually um, don't. Uh, Describe exactly what that is here, unlike all the other things. But uh, being sentient, being conscious, so uh, clear sentience, um, being aware of other forms of consciousness. I guess. Hang on, just a moment here, folks. I want to uh, get a type this word into uh, 
the search engineer to, so I can understand exactly what uh, clairsentience is because I don't understand why they don't uh, define it here. I mean, psychic sensing, psychic abilities. I mean, uh, emotion, clairsentience is a metaphysical sense that relates to recurring uh, physical and emotional feelings. I mean, some, I guess maybe they don't, didn't define it because it's kind of a debate as to whether it's psychic or whether it's uh, not psychic. Uh, I don't know. I guess it's a uh, point of view issue here when it comes to defining what clairsentience is. But but anyway, let's move on. A levitation. The ability to raise oneself into the air. Hmm. You see that with uh, people in uh, maybe in like India or something, but I don't really see that very often uh, in America because, well, not to be stereotypical or anything, but it seems like all those people in the countries of the East have a much easier time levitating than the people here in the West. What does that tell you? <laughs> well, I don't know, but make of that whatever you will. I can't raise myself. <laughs> That's certainly a would be a great quality if you could, uh, I mean, everybody has the ability to do it. It's just that why people can do it, well, same reason that psychics can be better psychics than other people. Their DNA has been uh, activated to uh, be able to do things like that more easily. But anyway, next we want to move uh, one on the list. Dreamwalking. Enter another person's dreams with your astral body. Whoa, isn't that a violation of free will in some regard to enter another person's dreams with your astral body? Well, not necessarily if you're not interfering with the person in the dream and just acting as like a fly on the wall. I guess then dream walking is not a problem. Uh, next article, uh, premonitions, having visions of future events. Yeah, well, the future is always in motion because of different timelines. And uh, it gets fuzzier and fuzzier as you uh, look in farther into the future but in the past is already set in stone in general. So, all right, next one, uh, astral projection. Everybody knows what that is. Um, getting the, uh, well, does everyone know what it is? Some people seem to con uh, confuse astral projection with an out-of-body experience, but they're not necessarily the the same. I mean, astral projection, you are you get into the astral plane, the astral realm. So um, I guess there is a little bit of a debate there as to what the proper way to define astral projection is and whether it is or is not the same as an out-of-body experience. I suppose one could be the other, but one is not necessarily the other in that sense. But uh, I guess we'll move on to the next list. Uh, telepathy, psychic communication. Uh, all right, everybody knows that. Like I said, psychics can, uh, some psychics are better psychics than others because their DNA is active. Um, more active than those who are not psychic in regards to the psychic DNA qualities. Um, IQ, more brain power. Yes, if you have an IQ above 150, you're a genius. If you have an IQ below 70, you are a retard. But some might say IQ tests are so flawed because it's a control system test, but I don't know. Uh, Precognitive dreaming, dreaming of future events. Yes, that's also like premonitions, having visions of future events, but this time it's in your dreams. Um, and some would say that dreams are going to be very vague in regards to to what the dream is, what message the dream is trying to convey. You really, really have to dig deep into the symbolism. And if some people think you're not dreaming enough and not dreaming as much as you want, think maybe you're smoking a little too much Mary Jane. Yeah, smoking a lot of pot can uh, take away from your ability to remember your dreams. So if you want to remember your dreams, you may have to cut back on your pot smoking if you're a pot smoker. Smoking pot is not a crime. Because the laws that make pot illegal are not laws. They're what someone considers to be public policy, but I'm not going to get into that. That's a whole new can of worms for another show. Uh, next one. Uh, eternal youth. Um, bodies don't appear to age anymore. Well, uh, I I mean, if you drink something like ozone water, then you're uh, going to appear younger than, than you actually are. I mean, sure, Greg Prescott could tell you that. He had gray hair in 2010, and... Uh, he well, I think his hair has turned gray again now, but he had blonde hair for a little while after starting to drink ozone water. So um, that makes you appear younger. And I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be done by ingesting ozone. If you uh, are really good at it, you can um, heal thyself, I guess, uh, and make yourself appear younger as you heal the parts of your body that make you appear older. So um, all right, enough of that. Next one: mo remote viewing. Visualizing events that happen anywhere. Yeah, and I mentioned earlier that as you try to remote view into the future, the farther and farther you get, the farther and farther it appears. 
the next article, uh, if I to keep saying next article, that's a force of habit from the new segments. Next one on the list, I should say, cryokinesis, the ability to control ice, and uh, pyrokinesis, the ability to control fire, hydrokinesis, the ability to control water, electrokinesis, the ability to control electricity. Hmm, which one would make you the most powerful? I don't know, but some would say electricity because we live in an electric universe. So if you control electricity, one might assert you could... Uh, Oh, um, that's much more powerful than having uh, cryokinesis, pyrokinesis, or hydrokinesis. And then there's chronokinesis, the ability to change one perception of time. Yes, you can uh, change the perception of time, not just by, well, smoking pot makes time uh, appear to go, go slower. And drinking cough medicine would do the same. But uh, like ingesting a stimulant like uh, like caffeine or nicotine may make uh, time appear to go a little bit faster. But that's... Um, that's uh, not doing it through chirokinesis. That's ingesting a substance. So, um, I mean, doing it yourself. Like, um, if you're going to be late for work and you want to get to work on time, you can envision yourself getting work on time, and then somehow, some way, you'll get to work on time. Getting back to that um, thing about using uh, uh, psychoactive substances to change time. Someone once told me that he was able to, um, like, travel a distance of. 20 miles in seven minutes once after he ingested some some LSD, some acid, and and I'm thinking, well, I guess because time is an illusion, and because that changed your perception of time, that's not so strange that something like that would happen. But I mean, being able to do it naturally without uh, having to ingest some sort of a substance, that's even more impressive. All right, next one here on the list. Intangibility, the ability to pass through solid objects. Yeah, like very few people can do that. Uh, force field, the ability to, to use the aura for defensive protection. Well, lots of people do that during their meditations, but being able to just do it at will anytime without having to meditate just to protect yourself from entities and such, that would be uh, that would be great if people could do that. If everybody could do that, the archon control system wouldn't stand a chance. Um, and again, it doesn't stand a chance because it's cannibalizing itself. Uh, next one, biokinesis, the ability to control genes in the body to alter your look. And I think I mentioned that earlier with um, body, bodies not appearing to age anymore with eternal youth, similar uh, idea there. I mean, um, I, there are some supplements you could take, like ozone water may make you appear younger. And like I take DNA force from InfoWars that does a lot of things for mitochondrial health, which could... Um, which could um, tr control the genes in the body to alter my look and all some other things too. I mean, I see myself in the mirror on a daily basis, so I don't really notice changes. But I'm guessing they're there, <laughs> and other people may notice them. Uh, next article. Uh, I'm not saying article. <laughs> Force a habit. Sorry. Next one on the list. Uh, psychometry to gain information by touching objects. Oh, yes, everything is information that's decoded, so simply touching it can allow you to decode it in some way, just like the Rendlesham Forest incident, the UFO. Touch the UFO, He, the guy got binary code um, transferred, I guess. Um, not necessarily information pertaining to the state of the object, but maybe the object is trying to convey some sort of a message. It could happen. Everything's got consciousness, you know. <laughs> uh there's telekinesis, the ability to move things with your mind. Yeah, that's kind of hard to do in this matrix, but it can be done. Star Wars movies are uh, truth-based on fiction. Yoda was able to get the ship out of a uh, Star Luke Skywalker ship out of the out of the the um, swamp, and uh, Luke was like, I, "I can't believe it! I can't believe you did that! I, I couldn't believe that it was possible to do that." And Yoda told him, "That is why you fail, because you don't believe." And then again, there's some people that never get it because they refuse to believe the incontrovertible truth. But that's a whole new can of worms. Not going to get into that. Next one, by location, the ability to be two places at once. Well, maybe not physically unless you can clone yourself. But your physical body is somewhere. But your spiritual body, your astral body could be somewhere else. Well, no, maybe some people can't clone themselves at will and Unlike so like some atomic particles can clone themselves at will, humans can do the same. But it seems so counterintuitive to be able to do that in a matrix this dense. 
but I'm sure it'll be more and more easier as this matrix keeps falling apart, because the archive control system keeps falling apart. Next one, teleportation, instantly transport anywhere. You have to be able to take all the particles of you and uh, move them somewhere else without killing you. Easier said than done, but it should be possible. After all, spooky action at a distance is possible, because space and time are illusions. That's quantum entanglement, spooky action at a distance, for those of you who are physics buffs. All right, flying, achieved through um, mastery of levitation. If you can levitate, then eventually you should be able to fly. Yeah, easier said than done. Uh, quick healing. Your rate of healing will increase. Yeah, we already talked about that earlier. Uh, mind reading. Yes, reading minds, I guess that's okay, but don't be reading everybody's mind because you want to invade people's lives and such. Uh, I guess only read minds when it's harmless to, to uh, I don't know, <laughs> then well, what is harmless? I mean, when it comes to law, we, there's harm only when the courts decide there's harm. Man, how do you say he harmed me by reading my mind? Well, how do you decide that? <laughs> so, um, if you can read minds, please don't use that power for selfish reasons, just like you should never use these powers for selfish reasons. And lastly, plant speaking, the ability to communicate with plants telepathically. I believe Elle's best in the animal communicator that I mentioned earlier in that N5D interview. She also can talk to plants in some regards, so that's not so uh, so strange. People can do that. All right, next uh, article. This is I, I can't say next article. This is the N5D article. Enlightenment signs, if you don't mind. I need another drink. Chances are we'll need a full two hours to to do this show because I'm going a lot faster than I than I thought. I mean, that's not really such a bad thing. I've done these show, two-hour shows by myself, and I often have a really sore throat after two hours that lasts the whole night. I don't know if it's just my talking style or my fast talking that causes that more so than other radio show hosts may suffer from it, but <sighs> not going to let that stop me. I mean, I remember during when I did that Wave X special, I started feeling really fatigued throughout the show, and then at the end of the show, it seemed like all my energy came back. Really strange, like maybe the wave X energies I thought were starting to affect me more, and um, and they stopped affecting me in negative ways as the show came on, and it was perfect timing because I was doing a wave X special. All right, I'm digressing. Let's get back to these um, articles here. Enlightenment signs uh, via wisdompills.com. This is uh, basically just a list here. One. If you can start the day without caffeine or pet pills, that's a sign of enlightenment. Well, I'm still taking caffeine. I sure am glad I stopped drinking five-hour energy. I mean, people were telling me five-hour energy, they are lying about what's in the bottle. I mean, five-hour energy, they say it um, has no sugar, it's only got four calories, it's basically just caffeine water, amino acids, and B vitamins. And it, they never actually specified how much caffeine was in them. They just said as much caffeine as a cup of the leading premium coffee. That, in a sense, was a lie, though, because they eventually uh, started putting the uh, amount of caffeine on, and one little bottle, regular 5-hour energy, has 200 milligrams of caffeine. The extra strength one has like 230 to 250 but that's a lot more than what the cup of leading premium coffee has. And uh, were they lying about what else is in the five-hour energy? Are they actually putting really bad stuff in there that's not in the supplement facts info? Oh, I hope not. But, I mean, if they were, it's a good thing I stopped taking it. I'm now ta I'm still taking caffeine. I'm taking CVS uh, pharmacy brand uh, caffeine pills. One pill has as much caffeine as a bottle of five-hour energy, 200 milligrams, but I always break it in half take um, one in the morning and then the one around three o'clock, but hopefully as the uh, vibrational frequency of the earth rises, I won't have to take as many caffeine pills anymore. So um, next one on the list, if you can be cheerful, ignoring aches and pains, then that is an enlightenment sign. Well, I mean, is it good to ignore aches and pains? I mean, well, your body is in pain because... It's trying to tell you that there's something wrong with that part of your body. So 
should you ignore it? Well, I mean, if it's just temporary pain that's there because of a temporary problem that can heal itself, then I guess ignoring it is okay. But it's funny how I bring this up because Sean Cohen was a, one of my biggest fans, if not my biggest fan, was and my first guest on my show was asking one of the previous guests what pain was. When I explain physical pain, that's got substance P. There's a, a thing in your body called substance P, and that needs to be present for there to technically be pain. I mean, there are other feelings of discomfort that we feel, like itching. That's a feeling of discomfort, one would assert. But there's no substance P involved, so it's not technically pain. And also being fatigued, that's a feeling of discomfort if you feel tired. But there's no substance P involved with fatigue, so therefore there's no pain. And that's from a physical standpoint. There's also the uh, the spiritual um, side of it, which Sean Cohen asserts the guy didn't really answer. But um, I guess um, if you're suffering spiritual pain, that's a lot. there's no question that's more significant than physical pain. Physical is just decoded. Spiritual is where it's at. If you have a choice between worrying about spiritual pain and physical pain, worry about the spiritual pain. But sometimes ignoring it is a good thing if it's only temporary and doesn't really need your attention other than the fact that you temporarily have it. All right, uh, moving on. If you can resist complaining and boring people with your troubles, that is an enlightenment sign. Well, what's, what is boring to someone might be extremely worth listening to another person. I mean, many would assert that learning about law is boring. But, I mean, if you listen to someone like in, like Eddie Craig or Randy Kelton or Winston Shroud or Dean Clifford, then that's they make learning about law anything but boring. They make it fun to study law in your free time. And, um, I mean, are those people complaining when they talk about the law? Well, yeah, in a sense they are. They're complaining about how tyrannical the court system is among other things and I mean they're trying to do it to educate people I mean if you're talking about your troubles your pet peeves or whatever they may be to enlighten people I mean I think that's a great enlightenment sign but then again if you're um, if you're complaining and boring people with your troubles and, and cannot resist it at all then that's obviously not a good thing. So you want to be able to resist it, even though there are times where complaining and boring people with your troubles and pet peeves can certainly help them by educating them about your troubles. It all depends on the circumstance in some regard. Uh, next enlightenment sign. If you can eat that same food every day and be grateful for it, that is an enlightenment sign. Oof. And my grandparents, my maternal grandparents must be very enlightened. They're both in their mid-80s, both have uh, dementia, and they basically eat the same thing for dinner. I've been told that by my mother. I don't remember what they eat for dinner, yogurt and something else, but it seems like that every day, and it doesn't bother them, and they're very grateful for it. So, I mean, they're grateful for food a lot because they lived through the uh, Second World War. My uh, maternal grandfather in Poland, my maternal grandmother in Germany... And uh, they saw all the horrors of the war from both sides of it and were very grateful for food as a result of that because food was kind of scarce in those times. And, and um, well, it's interesting how they the only reason they met was because the Yalta Conference which moved the border. And if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be here. But, okay, I'm digressing. This is supposed to be about being grateful for food and uh, eating the same food every day and being grateful for it. So um, I guess my point there is if you've been suffering a lot in the past, you're going to be grateful for food, even food you do not like, and you'll be able to eat it every day. So those who suffer will be able to attain enlightenment through suffering in the sense that they can eat the same food every day and be grateful for it, among other things. All right, next enlightenment sign. If you can understand when loved ones are too busy to give you time, that is an enlightenment sign. Yes, a lot of people will hassle and pester their loved ones saying, please look at me, pay attention to me. I I need attention and love from you. And... um. But if they're too busy to give you attention and you can understand that, well, you're obviously enlightened enough to realize that you can't hassle people because they're too busy. So don't be hassling and harassing those who are too busy. And if you don't understand it, then you got problems. Next one. If you can overlook when people take things out on you when through no fault of your own something goes wrong. Well, 
this happens all the time when it comes to shifting blame on and moving the blame to other people, even though it's not their fault. But then again, just like understanding when loved ones are too busy to give you time and not getting upset about it, being able to overlook when people take things out on you, same same idea there. It is a good sign when you can do that. Don't let those things get to you. Some things you just shouldn't let get to you. Or you're going to have trouble ascending. Sorry for my yawning. I'm not tired. I'm just low on low on air because I'm talking a lot. Next one. If you take criticism and blame without resentment. Oh, yeah. I was able to take a lot of criticism and blame without resentment when I played sports. Learning that if the coaches don't criticize you, they obviously don't care about you. I mean, blame. I mean, it, when it comes to do you deserve the blame or do you not deserve the blame? Well, either way, if you can take it without resentment, well, then it's a good thing. But... I mean, if you deserve the blame, try to make up for the thing you did wrong, I suppose, is the best way to go about it, even though you may not uh, have any resentment from the um, the criticism and blame from the person that gave you the blame, but still make up for it nonetheless. Uh, next one, if you can face the world without lies and deceit, well, uh, okay, a little mis- not, not so clear about this, um, well, if you're facing the world without telling lies and giving deceit, well then you're obviously a good, enlightened person. But if the world is not giving you lies and deceit, well, you're obviously handling the law attraction of law of attraction in a good way. You reap what you sow, so you're not getting lies and deceit, so you're not lying, you're being truthful, and you're not deceiving people, you're being honest. So, yeah, of course, that would be an enlightenment sign through the law of attraction. Uh, next one, if you can conquer tension without medical help. A little vague on what tension is in this sense. But, I mean, if you can heal thyself like Wolverine, then love the X-Men, then, well, of course, that's a sign of healing powers. And like with this article, it's a sign of enlightenment. All right, uh, next uh, one here. If you can relax without liquor, and also the one after that, if you can sleep without the aid of drugs, and that's related to the first one, if you can be, uh, excuse me, if you can start the day without caffeine or pep pills. Yes, I mean... (sighs) They say drugs are crutches, but then again, what's not a crutch if you're infinite consciousness? I bring this up because I'll never forget that my, in my interview with Stuart Swerdlow when he went off the deep end and said that not only are drugs crutches, but so are the crystals and the healing rods and the metaphysical tools that people use. You're infinite. Why do you need those things? Well, many would assert that's a ridiculous way of looking at it, especially in this matrix where there's free will interference and consciousness suppression. It makes no sense to to look at it that way. It, it, they would say it makes perfect sense to use those Egyptian healing rods and crystals and, and, other, and maybe even a few psychoactive substances because variety is the spice of life. But, I mean, it's a point of view issue, one of those agree to disagree issues. I can't really uh, take it any further than that, although I will say that it's really not in your best interest when it comes to the sleeping without the aid of drugs. You, you really, really do not want to um, take uh, take sleeping aids, even if you um, like need to go to, to sleep early. I mean, sometimes, well, one might assert it's better to uh, wake up tired and have to take caffeine than it is to take a sleeping pill to help you sleep and not have to take caffeine in the morning. Better take caffeine in the morning to stay awake than take this sleeping pill at night to help you go to sleep. I mean, am I wrong on that? I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. But, I mean, I've heard these uh, sleeping aids get a lot of bad rap. You really don't want to have to naturally um, hurt the way your body tries to fall asleep. You're supposed to go to sleep when you feel tired. But then again, it's not a good idea to be doing things that are going to keep you awake all night like maybe playing video games or something like that or staying on the computer when you're obsessing about something that you're trying to do, that's, that obsession is going to keep you awake and you're not going to bed in appropriate time, so of course you're going to wake up tired. So, I mean, um, like some like some stores, like Infowars, for example, they sell this thing called Knockout that's supposed to help you go to sleep and for a while it was actually sold out, couldn't get it. I don't buy it, but a lot of people do and that was probably a bad idea probably shouldn't do that. I mean, say what you want about how some people just have trouble going to sleep and need to get up early for work. It's still not in your best interest regardless to take the sleep aids. 
better to take the caffeine in the morning without the sleep aid. I I would assert if you had the choice. Uh, next one. Uh, this is the last one on the list here of enlightenment signs. If you can do all these things, then you are probably the family dog. Oh, <laughs> okay. That was uh, kind of a little bit of a joke there. But uh, all right, I'm not going to elaborate on that any further. Uh, next one. Nine guiding intentions is the next article from in 5D. All right. First, guiding intention. Seek your truth. The truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. No matter how discouraging of how many people oppose your truth, never stop seeking it. Both truth and wisdom are available only to those who have the courage to question what they have been taught. Yes, it's a shame that this matrix that we live in has been designed so that if you are, if you go along to get along with the sheeple, and if you um, decide not to dedicate your life posing conspiracies and expanding consciousness, then you're going to make a lot of money. Those that do not go to get along and those that dedicate their lives to exposing conspiracies and expanding consciousness are the ones who will struggle and not make as much money. It's the way the Matrix was designed. I mean, my father told me that if I expose, if I dedicate my life to exposing conspiracies, reveal, expanding consciousness, talking about ET cover-ups and all this stuff, I'll ne- he's like, I'll never, you'll never be able to get a job. And you know what my answer is? My answer is, good! I don't want no stinking job, because if I get a stinking high-paying job, I'm not going to be able to expose all this other stuff that I seek to expose to wake up humanity. And I choose to do that instead of get the higher-paying job, because I am not stupid. Stupid, and I understand that waking people up takes priority over making money, and living an unpleasant lifestyle is worth it, even if it means having to sell drugs and live off welfare for crying out loud. I mean, after I told my father that, and my mother too, they never uh, said anything to me about how my um, choices and doing things like this radio show and other things to wake people up are going to tarnish my life. They ran out of ideas after that because I made it clear I'm going to sacrifice everything, every luxury and every possible benefit in life I can to to seek truth and wake people up and nothing is going to stop me. So I mean, if you make that clear, then people are not going to hassle you and uh, and give you lectures about how your it will not go well for you and your life won't be, won't be luxurious and all. But uh, well, so what? That's the way the Matrix was designed. Act like you understand that, and as such, stop worrying about how about being successful. The only thing, I mean, in terms of money, the only thing you should be concerned about being successful is seeking truth and waking people up. I mean, there's a lot of sheeple out there who are going to differ with me on that, but that's the way I assert it. All right, number two, believe anything is possible. All things are possible regardless of perceived limitations. Don't be bound by limits of others or those um, you impose on yourself. At the fundamental level of reality, all is dictated by our beliefs and expectations. We are pure energy, and there is infinite potential in that energy. Well, if you're in infinite consciousness, which means infinite possibility, then, well, everything has to be possible. I mean, but, uh, I mean, I've heard people say anything is possible, but then they contradict themselves. Like, like Akashic Records reader Andrew Bartzis, I'd love to ask this, He's my favorite source, and I'd love to ask him this if I, if I could, how he can say that anything is possible, which he has, but yet he asserts that it is not possible for the powers that be to create a third world war because they don't have the resources. Okay, doesn't that contradict or claim that anything is possible? If anything is possible, then they should be able to create a third world war. So, it's one of those questions, it's one of those statements, anything is possible, that you might put an asterisk on, but what you write in the asterisk after the asterisk is uh, anyone's guess. But anyway, uh, all right, moving on. Number three, give service to others. Uh, Cultivate a habit of serving others, sharing your money, knowledge, service, wisdom, care, and love. Find a person who serves others, and you will find a happy person. In giving, you always receive more. Giving as many unexpected benefits from attracting more happiness into your life to inspiring others and changing the lives of those you touch. In the end, the whole world is made into a better place. It is a universal law. You only get back what you put in. Yes, you reap what you sow. So give service to others. I mean, some people don't give donations, among other things, because they think uh, they can't afford to give donations, but they don't realize that 
very often when you give a donation, I mean, if you don't get money back in return because you're able to sell, you'll get something in place of money, which is just as good, like maybe a couple big meals that you don't have to pay for. I mean, the universe will surprise you in many ways in regards to that. So give service to others, not service to self, and the universe will reward you sometimes in very, very intense ways. Number four, broadcast your light. A difficult proposition for many, especially those who perceive others with fearful interpretations or having done them wrong, or regardless of how you perceive others, see the love and creative source in all. For even those who play a role you disagree with are still taking a path which will lead them to the same place as you. Shine your light on those who need kindness, love, and compassion the most. It invites them into your circle of love. And that broadcasts in a matter that is so expansive across the universe that it is felt in galaxies as far as you can comprehend. Well, yes, you are infinite consciousness. You are just a smaller representation of the greater whole. The greater whole will try to divide itself into many different varieties just for the sake of experience. Think of the Mandelbrot set, which can be thought of as a representation of infinite consciousness. It's a, bio, uh, it's a finite-sized thing that looks like a beetle, but it goes into infinity. Zoom in on it. It goes into infinity. In, uh, and if you change even the like one of the smallest, well, there is, it's not one of the smallest because it goes into infinity. Like go, zoom in as much as you can and alter one of the smaller um, micro Mandelbrot set images, even the slightest bit, you will affect every single other um, Mandelbrot set piece in the whole Mandelbrot set. I mean, simply um, blinking your eyes affects everything in not just the universe but the multiverse, albeit in ex extremely small ways. We're talking like Googleplex decimal places after the zero points and then like a Googleplex z times a Googleplex zeros you'd have to go or something like that to um to notice the effect the per is of effect affects something like this percent. Uh it's so minute because you you have to go with so many places at the decimal point if, if I know maybe I hope this makes sense to you people when I'm trying to get here. Like, um, when you realize numbers go into infinity, you you can think of affecting something in the smallest way, like like what percent was this affected because that happened. You would have to say 0. 0.000 going several Googleplex times before you finally get to a number to show the extent to which blinking your eyes affected something in that multiverse. But that's what happens, and it has to happen because we're infinite consciousness. Um, all right, I'm confusing myself there trying to explain this, but uh, number five, everything is exactly where it is meant to be. You will never have any experience in your life without being part of that vibrational reality. You're on the same frequency as every single event you interact with. It's also through the chaos in your life and that of the world. All things perceived as positive or negative transmit by the potentials in the functioning of duality and polarity consciousness. They do not need to be fixed. They are exactly where they need to be. People are on the pain that will lead them to their highest good, even if you disagree with it. Oh, excuse me, it's not pain, the path. People are on the path that will lead them to their highest good, even if you disagree with it. Um, know that as difficult as it may be for you to accept at times, others are always on their best path, so honor it without judgment. Well, if you see a sheeple who refuses to accept the truth because they can't handle the truth, maybe then you might want to get in their face to wake them up because by not by being asleep, they're um, affecting everybody in unpleasant ways. I, I know I've gotten over that in many of my previous interviews, and many people are going to agree to disagree with me on this on the extent to which it's whether or not it's okay to hassle and harass the sheeple for being asleep and whether the fact that they're making life hard for us by being in a trance justifies hassling and harassing them to wake them up. I mean... I'm not really going to get into that here, but you have to understand that they're they're like that for a reason. You're like the way you are for a reason. There's no such thing as a coincidence. I'm willing to bet the word coincidence was created by the powers that be, powers that should not be, whatever you want to call them, in order to uh, uh, downplay the fact that synchronicities are real. So everything happens for a reason. All right, number uh, six. See the creative source in everyone and everything. Source, God, Allah, Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever else you would like to call it, is all the same and there is only one. It is in everyone and everything. It is in every molecule that makes all that is. It is everywhere spanning across all of time and space instantaneously. 
see the God in everyone you interact with, regardless of their beliefs, uh, religion, race, age, and any other system of separation humans hold dear. If you see the God in them, it creates a commonality that allows you to share love in a very unique way that transcends some of the highest levels of judgment experienced as human beings. Why is it that many of those who we consider enemies have been our greatest teachers? All relationships resolve back to a common denominator, love. See it for what it is in all that you encounter, and you will not only honor what you are, but also what they are. Yes, uh, it's a shame, though, that a lot of people, when it comes to religious faith, will get hassled by those of other faith because they cannot do what, what this article, number six um, article here, suggests that they do, which is love everyone regardless of faith. I mean, freedom of religion is great, unless you founding fathers are putting in the First Amendment. But the fact that religions suppress consciousness and the fact that religions cause conflict, it's it's part of the duality in this matrix, and it can even lead to people not wanting to talk to other people. Like I had a guest, not going to give their name, would have been a great guest, but like four days before the show, after I had already prepared the show, the guest tells me, I don't want to come on your show because we have differences in spiritual opinion. I'm not a Christian. I'm a metaphysics lover, as if that can be a religion. And um, they're uh, I'm not a New Age guy. New Age is all about um, sitting, uh, like doing nothing because it's all love and you ha just ignore the fear. It's not like that. But, but okay, I'm digressing. This person that declined to come on my show was a very devout Christian, took the Bible literally. But that's not why I wanted them to, um, to come on my show. I wanted them to come on to expose some important stuff. But they wouldn't do that because I guess they listened to a couple of my shows and decided that because we have differences in spiritual opinion, they shouldn't come on, which I find kind of ridiculous. I mean, if you truly believe in the First Amendment as this person does, then it would make no sense that differences in spiritual opinion would be an excuse to not come on my show. And, uh, I mean, there are times where I talked about, like, Jesus Christ, his story's been twisted, and anybody who hears statements like how Je there was like there was a Jesus, like Andrew Bartz, the Akashic Records, who says Jesus did exist, he was a solar being, an incarnate of the sun, but his story has been twisted. I mean, someone who takes the Bible literally would probably take offense to that, and like talking about how the story of Jesus is just a metaphor for the sun going across the, the zodiac um, throughout the year. People take the Bible literally would be offended by that, and they would have a tough time. You see the creative source in everyone and everything. I mean, there's a growing movement in America, and well, a growing movement everywhere of people like me who are spiritual but not religious. But if they try to join like a patriot community group that's made up of a lot of devout Christians, there's going to be problems. I had that problem when I was a member of a group, a patriot community group, and I was not like the only non-Christian. They made a group, a special group for me to talk about, among other things, spiritual stuff, and also ETs and UFOs, because I was the only person in that Patriot community group interested in that stuff. And, I mean, I thought they were doing me a big favor and all by that, and they really cared about me. But I, after I put some spiritual posts, they asked me, are you going to be posting spiritual stuff about Christianity? And I said, no, of course not. I'm not a Christian. I mean, but if, I mean, if there's, like, First Amendment freedom of religion issues, then yeah, I'll post it here, but... I'm a metaphysicist guy, not a Christian guy. And I made that clear when I first joined the group. And I thought it wasn't a problem, even though I knew everybody was a Christian. But it turned out to be a problem because I ended up getting banned from the group, tried to log in, couldn't log in. And then I asked what's going on here, and the head of the group said, you've been removed altogether. And I said, oh, yeah, for what? Um, you created all this stuff for me to treat me as a special case in the group because you were acknowledging what I was doing. And... You um, And I made it clear that I wasn't a Christian, so I had no reason to think that not posting Christian spiritual stuff would be an issue. The only guy's response was, you are good at what you do, but many people in the group, including me, do not feel you are a good fit. And then he said, I do not wish to discuss or debate this any further. Well, of course he would say that. Of course he didn't want to discuss or debate it any further. Because he knew that if he did discuss and debate it, I'd make him look like a total jerk. And what was really sad was a couple of days after that, he actually befriended me on Google+. Plus send me a friend request, and I'm thinking, oh, is this supposed to make me feel better? You kick me off your group, and then you try to befriend me because you feel bad about doing to me, and I didn't want to befriend me? It's not right. This is not the way truth movement should, even if we're different, should 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 act like this. And 
And then, you know, it was very fitting that about a month after that, I didn't discover until about several months after this, but I found out I found out a few months later that like one month after that message, that friend request was sent to me by the guy who kicked me out. He said that that group that I got kicked out of, the Patriot Community Group, it disbanded. And after I heard that, I thought, well, this is only fitting. It's only appropriate that this group would would disband after what they did to me. I mean, it, it, it makes perfect sense, and it did make sense, I think. But it was still sad. I mean, we couldn't see the creative source in everyone and everything despite our differences. And I know I spent a lot of time talking about this one thing, but something I can relate to. And besides, I need to get a two-hour show in, or at least try to. So I hope you all learn something through this and won't let differences in spiritual faith keep you from not appearing on people's radio shows or letting them join your groups if they're good at what they do and and whatnot. But anyway, um, getting on, uh, number seven, following your passion is the one. Following your passion, uh, let yourself be curious. Ignite curiosity for your passion and a world you can't see. Recognizing the recurring themes in your life and how it creates a pattern for you to either follow or change. What themes or lessons seems to constantly service in your life? What are you drawn to again and again? Learn to investigate the difference between disagreements and personal attacks, between feedback and criticism, and why they exist. If you are not enjoying it, you're probably not that passionate about it. Make a plan shift to make a livelihood out of what you are most curious and passionate about. The money will follow. Yes, the universe will often give you what you need, not necessarily give you what you want, unless you're good at the law of attraction. But, I mean, if you're not using the law of attraction, but are still living your life to the fullest, positive fullest, love-based fullest, then they'll give you what you need to keep going, even if it's like someone donating money or giving you food or something like that. Um, But I follow my passion all the time, and even though I've had to make sacrifices, works for me. All right, number eight. Be in gratitude, and a lot of you know, I, a lot of meditations that I do that use like like money and and, attra- and abundance attraction meditations. They say um, you know, during the meditation when you start feeling a great sense of gratitude for everything. They say this is one of the most important parts of this meditation. If you don't feel gratitude, the law of attraction will not manifest anywhere near as good as it could if unless you are. Uh, that if you're not in gratitude, then it's not going to manifest as much as if you were in great gratitude. Gratitude is very important. Be grateful for things. Uh, appreciate what you have and value it. Uh, try counting your positives and be grateful for all the good things and people in your life. If you're concerned about wealth and success, know that these can be whatever you like. Abundance comes in many forms. Treat failure as an opportunity to learn a new and better lesson from life. And that's the trick to manufacture optimism and be in an eternal state of gratitude. Once you have a grateful outlook on life, you will also have increased life satisfaction, happiness, optimism, hope, and less of all those emotions perceived as negative. All right, and last but not least, number nine, this is a no-brainer, love who you are. No change starts outside of yourself. Change starts first from within. It is impossible to accept the inherent beauty in all living things if we cannot accept our own beauty. Excuse me, it is self-programming. Loving yourself isn't a one-time event. It's an endless, ongoing process. It begins with you, enfolding yourself in your own affection and appreciation. Your worth is in your true nature, a core of love and inner goodness. You are a divine being of beautiful light and love, and nothing will ever change that. Well said. Well said. Good way to end the article there. And one last article. Let me just get another drink. Looks like I won't be getting a full two hours. Not a problem. Like I said, I probably have a really, really sore throat if I went a full two hours. But this last article, 11 Pearls of Wisdom from the 14th Dalai Lama. Now, a lot of people may have just heard this and are thinking, why are you uh, listening to the Dalai Lama? The Dalai Lama follows Buddhism. And Buddhism may be the religion that's most accurate in terms of metaphysics, but in the end, even the Buddhists got it wrong. And that's not me talking, that's Akashic Records reader Andrew Bartz is talking. And I also, uh, one time on Facebook, I saw Greg Prescott of N5D with a, next to, with a picture, he put, uploaded a picture of himself with his hand on a statue of the Buddha, and I left a comment, are you sure you want to associate Buddha 
uh, Buddhism is the religion that's the best in terms, uh, most accurate in terms of metaphysics. But in the end, even the Buddhists got it wrong. And that's not me talking. That's Akashic Records reader Andrew Parts is talking. I saw a comment from Michelle Walling, Walling saying, oh, my God, Andrew, you did not just say that. <laughs> yes, I did say that. But the Dalai Lama, does he have Illuminati connections? Well, David Icke in his books says, yes, he does. But it, I am... In many ways, I am inclined to believe that the Dalai Lama doesn't so much work for the Illuminati as much as he is an innocent pawn in regards to what the Illuminati wants. I mean, the Illuminati is very well aware that Buddhism is very close to being accurate in terms of metaphysics, but not entirely accurate, like Barthes has said, and... And the Dalai Lama, they can use him to, as someone to pass off great knowledge and wisdom and what appears to be great consciousness, expansion, information. But then he's furthering their agenda by um, by um, sharing Buddhism, which does have a couple flaws. So, I mean, uh, the Dalai Lama, I, I've, list, I've watched some videos of him. Like there's this uh, on the UFO uh, TV studios channel. There's a... Uh, speech he gave um, like to a whole crowd of people that seemed very, very enlightening. I mean, it seemed like a good message in so many ways, not things the Illuminati would necessarily want someone to say, but uh, it's kind of a tough call to, to determine the connections between the Illuminati and the Dalai Lama. I guess talk to David Icke or maybe Fritz Springmeyer if you want to know the the truth behind that, but th I'm sure there is some connection at some level, even though it's not necessarily me and the Dalai Lama or any of his followers are bad people. I mean, don't get me wrong, those Tibetan Buddhist monks, they're, they're fascinating folks, the way they can meditate for long periods of time and even in frigid, cold temperatures, like putting these really cold rags over them and then meditate as if the cold wasn't bothering them. That's that's impressive, to say the least. And uh, a lot of people would kill to be able to do that. But... Um, but then again, it's Buddhism and Buddhism has flaws. I keep saying that over and over, but it's never going to get old. But all right, enough of that. Let's uh, do these 11 pearls of wisdom from the 14th Dalai Lama. He is a monk and the spiritual head of Tibetan Buddhism. Today's current Dalai Lama is the 14th Dalai Lama, and he is known worldwide for spreading a message of compassion and tolerance. Um, below you will find a few. Um, and by the way, the art, um, writer of this article was Andrea Shulman, a guest writer in 5D few of her favorite quotes from the 14th Dalai Lama. My hope is that they bring us a little extra peace today. Uh, so I guess I'll treat this as a agree to disagree kind of thing. So the Dalai Lama's first quote, in the practice of tolerance, one's enemy is the best teacher. Okay, I'm not really going to agree or disagree with that as much as say, okay, that makes sense. Uh the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and in the practice of tolerance, your enemy can help teach you because you'll become tolerant of your enemy. Makes sense. Number two, we can never obtain peace in the outer world until we make peace with ourselves. I agree. Enough said. Number three, sleep is the best meditation. Well, it, I guess it makes sense that it would be the best meditation. But then again, there are some people that say that there are certain meditations that they do that they enjoy more than sleep. I mean, like let's imagine for a moment, three. if they, there's a full moon on a given night, it's 3 a.m. And you're the kind of guy that likes to go outside during the full moon. And, and the totality is like at 3 a.m. and you want to meditate during full moon totality. Uh, full moon totality. In the light of the full moon, it's 3 a.m. But does it make sense to stay awake at 3 a.m.? Wouldn't you be, get a better full moon meditation if you slept instead of went out and meditated in the light of the moon? It's a debatable subject there. But, um, like, like, for example, on uh, December 21st, 2012, the, um, in my area of the world where I live, uh, the uh, winter solstice on... Um, on that day was at 6.11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I got up extra early that day. I usually don't have to get up until around 8 o'clock. But that day I got up earlier to meditate during that time period. And it was very interesting. I seem to recall meditating for what I thought was like only 15 or 20 minutes. 
But in the end, I meditated for almost half an hour, making that whatever you will. But um, many would assert that it would have been a better meditation for me to just stay asleep and not meditate during that solstice. But, okay, I guess I'll agree with the idea that sleep is the best meditation. Number four, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. Well, yeah, if you're going to make yourself happy, then of course you want to practice compassion. Others will be happy as a consequence because you are you are a reflection of, of infinite consciousness. The world you decode is a reflection of you. So, um, of course, people are going to be happy if you are happy if by practicing compassion. So, I agree, it makes sense. Number five, we all have to live together so we might as well live together happily. Thank you for stating the obvious. I agree. <laughs> Number six, look at situations from all angles and you will become more open. Thank you for stating the obvious. I agree. Number seven, disagreement is something normal. Well, this is not so much stating the obvious as much as it is pointing out something that people should be more aware of, even though it is obvious, because, well, people disagree in this duality matrix because it's a matrix of duality, so it's normal. But if we get into a much higher dimension, density, or realm of consciousness, whatever term you want to use, then, I mean, eventually it's no more service to self, it's strictly service to others, then I guess disagreement is um, not normal and shouldn't exist anymore. But that's going to the deep end. Number eight, in order to carry a positive action, we must develop here a positive vision. Yes, because your actions will manifest from your your visions. If you envision it, and you envision it well, and you don't have any subconscious or subliminal blocks in you that can prevent that, um, vision from becoming action, then it should work out. All right, number nine. The purpose of our lives is to be happy. That was the same thing that my um, teacher in some psychology class I took in the fr my freshman year of college said the purpose or the meaning of our lives is to be happy. Well, I disagree. Because it's not the number one most important purpose or meaning of life. You want to be happy. Who doesn't? But the purpose in life, many would assert, the number one purpose, there's two things I could um, give as to what I would throw as uh, the purpose of my um, life and why I would agree to disagree with, with this. I would say one purpose in life, resolve karma. But another purpose in life, expand consciousness. But you can't resolve karma, excuse me, you can't expand consciousness unless you first resolve karma, one would assert. And the followers of the late Dolores Cannon would definitely assert that because she was always stressing resolving karma. So when it comes to expanding consciousness, many would assert that the number one key to do that is is to resolve karma in order to expand consciousness. So if I'm going to have to be forced to choose between the two, I think I would say the purpose in life is to expand consciousness. Because you are infinite consciousness, you want to get closer to to source. And um, so that, I would say, would be the number one, number one purpose in life. So this is one Dalai Lama statement I disagree with. Number 10. Happiness is not something ready-made. It comes from your own actions. Yes, it does come from your own actions. And uh, Zulu Shaman Credo Mutwa, he said that the best advice his mother ever gave him was, if something unpleasant happens to you, you have no one to blame but yourself. Yes, don't shift blame to others. And uh, your own actions were the result of it. And therefore, if you are happy as a result of your actions, you've got no one to thank. To th I don't know. Well, wait a minute. Let's think about this for a moment. Your own actions make you happy. But other people involved 
in um in the process of making you happy as a result of your action. So many would assert it doesn't make sense to give yourself all the credit for being happy if there were other people involved. Now, some people who disagree with Creed, uh, Zulu Shame and Credo Mutwa's claim that you got no one to blame but yourself would, would assert that to say that he's mistaken. You have to look at what I just said about how if other people involved in making you happy in your trek to becoming happier – then don't just thank that, thank yourself, thank them for also making you happy, then it would make sense somewhat assert not just to blame yourself, but it is okay in that regard to shift a little blame on some of the other people that made you upset. I mean, I don't know. It is a agree to disagree point of view issue in that regard, but I don't know. I'm not going to elaborate on that any further other than say it is an agree to disagree point of view issue in whether you don't just blame yourself or you don't just thank yourself for having bad things or happy things happen to you. All right. And last but not least on this list, well, actually, before I do that, let me see if uh don't have anyone in the chat room, don't have anyone in the caller queue. Friday night's not necessarily the best time to do a show. And again, a lot of people in America don't go out all that much. They just sit in front of the computer or the television, <laughs> unlike some other countries where everybody goes out. Well, that's stereotypical, somewhat absurd. But uh, I just heard that from some, some British show. Some British guy said that about Americans. They don't go out. They just sit in front of the television all the time. So, uh, But anyway, this will be uploaded to YouTube, so everybody will be able to listen to it at a, at a later time. So number 11, last but not least, on the uh, 11 pearls of wisdom from the 14th Dalai Lama. My religion is very simple. My religion is kindness. Okay, um, what, what your religion is, is or is it, can that be called a religion? What is a religion? Well, what is mythology? Religion and mythology, Jordan Maxwell says, are the same thing. It's just that you wouldn't call something a religion unless you believe it to be true. You wouldn't call something mythology unless someone else believed it and you did not believe it to be true. Or not most of it, or some of it you didn't believe to be true. And uh, looking at these quotes from the Dalai Lama, I mean, it's great to be happy, it's great to be kind, but maybe this might have something to do with where the Buddhists screwed up in, in regards to that part where they were wrong about metaphysics. And here I go again with this. <laughs> um... It's, they're, they're obsessing too much about happiness and kindness when, hmm, maybe, just maybe, this is the transfer of sorts. Because, like, they created the New Age movement for the people that realize religions are frauds. The New Age movement basically says just be happy all the time and everything will work out nicely, which doesn't take into account the fact that there's a matrix that you're living in with a lot of free will interference and acting like an ostrich with your head in the sand doesn't work. Well, it seems like, judging by these quotes, I mean, I could be mistaken here. If I am, by all means, someone tell me. But it seems like Buddhism is somewhat new agey because they obsess about being happy as the meaning of life and being kind and talking about that as a religion when you really can't always be happy and always be kind in a matrix that's got duality in it. So I don't know. Maybe I'm mistaken in asserting that this is why Buddhism is is wrong. I unfortunately don't remember what Andrew Barthes has said was the number one reason why Buddhism is wrong, for lack of a better word, in regards to metaphysics, even though it is the most accurate religion, religion in terms of it. But it, it, it kind of does make sense here that if you see that the New Age movement was created to suppress the consciousness of people that saw through the fraud of religion, that Buddhism would, being accurate in terms of metaphysics more so than other religions, would have some connections to to New Age movement. And judging by these quotes here by the Dalai Lama in regards to kindness and happiness, it, I, I do see a sense of a little bit of a connection there. But I'm not really an expert on this, so I don't think I should be talking about this any further. Like I said earlier, let me make it very clear. Bless the Founding Fathers for putting the First Amendment right to freedom of religion in the uh, First Amendment. That was wonderful. <laughs> So uh, that is enough of that. This show is coming to an end now. Didn't get a full two hours in, but that's okay. So I got a lot of important information out. So that is the end of this show. Uh, next um, Wednesday, I will be having Daniel Teague on. 
um, on the uh, 16th from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. He, uh, kind of interesting, originally he uh, he wanted to come on, but then I kind of confused him in regards to how I wanted to approach the show, and he said he didn't want to come on, but then I told him, no, 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 you got it all mistaken, that's not what I meant, and he was like, oh, sorry, I'll be more than happy to come on now, I'd love to come on, and ever since then, he's been... He's he's been sending me a lot of messages saying I'd like to do this for people in the show. I'd like to do that. I'd like to try to talk about this. I really want to make the most of the show. So that was a nice turn of events there, and I really look forward to the show. And um, I'm gonna definitely have to do a lot of uh, checking over the the um, messages that Daniel Teague sent me in regards to how he want what he wants me to say in regards to the show and all that. He's taking this very seriously, and well, I admire him for that. If anybody wants a primer prepare for my show with him next week, I recommend listening to Michelle Walling's interview on N5D Radio with Daniel Teague. I know I listened to that back in the day. I don't remember much of it, but I must have listened to it because I usually listen to those N5D Radio interviews on the Cosmic Awakening show with, with Michelle. So check that out if you want to learn, learn a few things about Daniel Teague. He'll be the guest next week. This is Andrew Fisher signing off from Nature Reality Radio. And I want to stay everyone. Enjoy the rest of your track that infinite consciousness.